Welcome to The Unlimited Show, where we show you through God's Word how you can live life unlimited with Dr. Desmond Ford, Dr. Eliza Gonzalez, and friends. This program is brought to you by Good News Unlimited, where the Word spreads fast. Today, we're answering the question, Who is Jesus? And now, please welcome Dr. Desmond Ford. Would you like a shortcut to solving all the problems of life? Of course. Well, here it is. Answer this question. Who is the man that appeared in Galilee and Nazareth in Israel 2,000 years ago? claiming to be the Son of God. Think of some of his claims. He spoke about before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, I am. Remember God spoke to Moses, I am. Jesus spoke about the glory he had with the Father for the world was. He claimed all authority in heaven and earth. What a claim. All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. He said all the angels were his. When the Son of Man comes with his angels in his glory, he said we should love him even more than we love our own parents. He said he could forgive sin. He said he would be the judge of the world. He said he would come again to make an end of evil and pain and suffering and to usher in everlasting joy. Who is he? Well, the best test for man's claims is what happens when he's in pain. Look at him on the cross, spiked, thorns, tears, blood. What happened to his claims then? Didn't budge. He still had a kingdom. He promised the thief, you're going to be in my kingdom. He was still looking after his mother. Behold thy mother. Behold thy son, Mary and John. He's still in possession of all power in heaven and earth. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, the one who died for you. You're watching The Unlimited Show, helping you live an unlimited life. And now, a minute for good news with Lamon Eglintolz. He never gained political office. He never accumulated wealth. He didn't write a book. And at the end of his life, it actually looked like he didn't really accomplish much at all. Yet, because of his teaching, more schools have been established. Because of his influence, more hospitals have been created. And because of his words, more languages have been translated into a written form around the world. He has been the most significant an influential person of all of history. And to millions of people in their own lives, in their own history, he has been one who has given them a purpose to live, a reason. He has given them motivation and encouragement to face each day ahead of them. Who is Jesus? Jesus is one who has changed history. He has changed society. He has changed my life. He has changed millions of lives around the world, and he can change your life too. Thank you for watching The Unlimited Show. This program has been paid for by the Friends of Good News Unlimited. And now, a minute for good news with Dr. Philip Rodinov. Uh, The historian La Tourette wrote over 80 books and was awarded honorary doctorates from 17 universities. He said the following about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the most influential life lived on this planet. There's no question that many people regard Jesus Christ as a great teacher, as even a prophet. Believers and unbelievers alike actually regard him as one of the greatest people who ever lived. But there's more than that. Jesus claimed to be God. In fact, it's this claim that led his enemies to kill him. 
but significantly he rose from the dead and many millions have believed in this and in him in the years following. The good news is that we can have a wonderful life that he is offering us now and in the future if we accept the gift that he is offering to us. It's time now for a good news chat. Please welcome our panel, Dr. Des Ford, Colin McLaurin, and Dr. Eli Gonzalez. Well, today I'd like to welcome Des Ford and Colin McLaurin. And we're going to be discussing the topic, what are the obstacles to belief in Jesus Christ in our modern society and uh, how can they be overcome? So, Colin, I'd like to uh, just start with you first. How, how would you respond to that question? Ellie, I think the main obstacles to Jesus are not actually to Jesus per se, but more to church, Christianity, God. And uh, people have a very different perception of those things rather than Jesus himself. But as for their scepticism or uh, troubles with Jesus directly, I think one challenge would be that maybe people don't know much about Jesus these days. Um, people still think of him as a loving person, a great teacher, a good bloke, to use Aussie terminology. But maybe they don't know so many details these days. It'd be one challenge. Okay. So, Des, so Des do you think that, uh, I mean, we ostensibly live in Christian societies in the United States, here in Australia also, for example. But do you think that uh, uh, the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ has been dumbed down? Ellie, I think you're too generous. I don't think this is a Christian society at all. This is a post-Christian society. Not one person in ten that we encounter on the streets cares a fig about Jesus Christ. But the values of uh, Christianity seem to underlie some of our cultural institutions. Yeah, still. but they're superficial. They don't go very deep. So what do you reckon, Colin? Uh, are we saying then that uh, it's a lack of knowledge about Jesus Christ that is a, is a key obstacle to people believing in him? I'd say that is a key obstacle, the lack of knowledge, but more so it could be a heart matter as well, that many people don't care, like Des said. If they cared, they'd learn more, but, yeah. Well, I guess if it was a, it was a knowledge deficit, uh, that would be easy to overcome by more preaching, you know, more yeah. education. Read the Wikipedia article. Read the Wikipedia Google articles it. You know, that's, about Jesus. That's the only way to find information, right? Yeah, that's it. Des. Ellie. We Christians have to learn that we're in the business of tempting people. Are we? We should so live that we tempt people to want to be like us. You see, we're not lawyers. We're witnesses. We should be so reflecting the love of Christ and the joy that's found in him that people will want it. When Gandhi was asked why he wasn't a Christian, he gave one word answer. Christians. <laughs> Most Christians that's are right. not tempting others to be like them. We need to be tempters. Well, you've moved the discussion to another level, I guess, Des, because we are talking about, you know, that uh, people just don't know about Jesus Christ. They just don't have the facts. And I guess there's a role for, for Christians in, in sharing the facts. But you're talking about something else here that doesn't have they to be They won't even knowledge. want to know unless we are a shining example of what a follower of Christ should be like. We must help them to see we have something that we want to give them, not thrust upon them, but to give them. And they must want it. We must tempt them to become Christians. So, Colin, what's wrong here? Because if what Des is saying is right, you know, I'd, I'd think that there are actually plenty of Christians, there's plenty of churches, you know, all over Australia, all over New Zealand, all over the United States, all over Europe, all over Africa. Um, and they're all Christian churches. Why? What's missing that we aren't tempting people to uh, to follow Jesus? It's a tough question, and I'm sure that people will sharply disagree with me on this. I think really we can challenge both sides of the picture. Uh, many people do not want to know. You know, they don't want to acknowledge. There's a lot of inspiring Christian people out there. Too many of the media reports are about the fundamentalists and the extremists and all this sort of thing. And I feel that it's unfair and builds up a false picture. And I'm not just blaming the media here. I think it's a public willing to absorb all this critical attitude. At the same time, yes, of course, churches, Christians haven't been perfect. 
And I absolutely agree with Des that we need to be examples of, of Jesus in the world, human as we are, imperfect as we are. Ellie, can I underline what has just been said by yeah. Colin? We've got lots of fans of Jesus, but not many followers. Yes. A follower of Christ is prepared to forsake all that he has. He loves Christ more than father and mother. He doesn't own anything. It's all his. He's only a steward. It's a very revolutionary thing. You remember Bonhoeffer said when Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die, to die to selfishness. So there are lots of fans, but there are not many followers. People profess Christ, but they don't possess him. You know, I, I like uh, to read and study about early Christianity. And Jesus started with a lot of fans and maybe just a handful of followers at the cross. And within a very few generations, Jesus had so many followers that he had conquered the Roman Empire at many levels. So why is that not happening today? Well, perhaps we should point out what the historians would tell us, that it wasn't that people were converted to the gospel, they were persuaded by governments to follow Constantine. That's the main reason Christianity spread. It wasn't because of great evangelism and multi-conversions. They were pushed into the sea and baptised en masse without ever having been born again. Being a Christian is something very distinct. It's not like joining a club. Well, based on, on that, Des, I can have two responses. This is just me. I can feel either very despondent and depressed that in 2,000 years the church largely hasn't got it right, or I can feel very encouraged that there is still a work of the Holy Spirit to be done in this world uh, and, that, and that we need to seek that promise, you know, the, the promise of, of, the, of which Pentecost was only just a foretaste that was promised by the prophets that Jesus foreshadowed and John the Baptist foreshadowed in his ministry. What do you reckon about that, Colin? I, I believe if people really search for it, they'll see amazing examples of the church or God at action in the world. And many people don't seek or they're prejudiced by a stereotype from 50 years ago and they're not aware of the faith and renewal that's going on in so many communities around the world. So I believe if people are open and seeking, they'll find God. Yeah, that's true because, you know, I have to say that uh, I think it's true that many people look for the action of God in the world, but only within their own little community. Um, so what is it going to take, Des, for, for people who love the gospel all over the world to rise up and finish the, this work, the, the preaching of uh, the, the Great A Commission? A good start would be to make sure we understand the gospel. There Absolutely. are many things that pass as a Christian gospel that are quite foreign to the New Testament. I think Christians need to study the book a lot more closely. We need to look at some of the symbols there. Christians are salt. Well, you don't have a lot of salt. It's a little surrounded by non-salt. But the gift of the gospel is under the symbol also of a treasure hid in the field which a man sells all that he's got, thoroughgoing, complete. To understand the Christian gospel, one must be fully committed. It is not enough to be a fan. Thanks, Des. And now just to finish up, I'm going to ask you to give both of you, please, just to give a one word answer to this question. What is the solution to unbelief? Des? One word. Christocentricity. How's that? Oh, that's hyphenated, but from you, <laughs> I'll take it. Go Germans on. make ten words into one. Can we do that? <laughs> um, well, you know, the, the, the way the New Testament was written, it didn't, they didn't have spaces between words, so you could give me the whole New Testament. <laughs> but no, one word. What's, what is the solution to, to overcoming unbelief in our modern world? Um, I'll say faith. Jesus is the obvious answer, Jesus. <laughs> well, that's what we all need more of. That's who we all need more of. Thank you so much, Des, and thank you so much, Colin. Thank and you, thank you for uh, listening in and watching our, our discussion. You're watching The Unlimited Show. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. 
You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. And now, Living Unlimited, focusing on practical Christianity with Biliana De Soto. In a world full of insecurity and fear, where are you and I to find our source of strength and peace? If you are a God believer, then you do have an answer. In quietness and in confidence will be your strength, says your God. Be still and know that I am God. And again, the Bible says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen you. Now, if you're anything like me, doing things in a fast paced way is what I really enjoy and like to do. I really am not a very patient person and running before I hear the Lord speaking is something that I have been very good at. And I do really feel that this talk is for all of those who perhaps like me tend to run in front of God and tend to be so busy with life, thinking that perhaps in so many ways we're all adequate. We think in so many ways that we can produce and edit and direct our own scenes in life. And while ever the going is good, well, well on good. But every now and then, things don't really turn out the way that we'd like them to. And every now and then, I think I kind of treat God almost as if, uh, God, look, just here, I wouldn't mind if you'd play the role of an assistant editor. This particular scene hasn't quite gone to plan. But, you know, um, God, please don't sort of get carried away with it all because really I'm not giving you the director's role. I think um, I have found that that just hasn't worked. If God is to be God at all, he really does want to be God in all. And um, I do find that in a life that is frenzied and so fast paced, I, we all need answers. We all look for answers in conferences in seminars. Think of all the best-selling authors who make their living from, uh, you know, giving us help and advice. What about all the psychics? The psychics have never been busier. People are searching for answers. And where are they finding them? God is suggesting, no, let's change that world, word. God is inviting us to a very personal, quiet audience with him where he is able to be God and where I stop with the chattering of my own mind and with my own thoughts and where I tune in, not just the mind of God, but the heart of God, where I hear him speak peace to my soul where I hear him giving me the confidence, the strength. After all, he is the God of the universe. He is the mastermind. With him is the source of all wisdom, all power, all knowledge. And to boot, he says he loves me. So in his presence, there is security. There is that assurance that I need. There is that wisdom. And I really do tune in to this word, wait. And I think it's very purposeful on God's part. We do rush along. We do think the world revolves around us. We are the center of the universe. And if anything gets in between us and our schedule, well, we're not very happy. But God, who is in control of all time, of all circumstances, who has been into the future that I am about to step in, there is no such thing as time with God. He is the great I am. Now, tomorrow, 
and yesterday are all in the now. And in his presence, I can enjoy the now. So come into his presence with gladness and quieten your own chatter and hear from God. Be still and have the peace that passes all understanding come into your heart. You're watching The Unlimited Show, helping you live an unlimited life. And now, please welcome Dr. Eliza Gonzalez for today's main presentation. You know, too many people confuse popular ideas about what religion is all about with the message of Jesus Christ. And so I come across people who say, well, I don't belong to any religion because they're all fake. I follow Jesus Christ. I, I, I actually don't belong to any particular church. And then there's other people on the opposite end of the spectrum who say, well, I belong to X and Y denomination and uh, because, uh, because they follow Jesus Christ correctly. So you have these two ideas about Jesus and religion. Who's right? Is it Jesus or is it religion? Well, let's have a look at just a few facts about this. First of all, Jesus Christ never actually established any religion. Uh, he didn't establish a religion called Christianity while he was here on earth. In fact, he never even called people to leave their current uh, religion and to join his religion. He didn't do that either. And thirdly, he was also unflinchingly critical of some of the practices of the established religion of his day. Now, they're all facts. You know, many people think Jesus Christ established Christianity. Well, Jesus Christ is certainly the leader of, of Christians everywhere, but he didn't ever establish a separate religion to start with. On the flip side of that, we also have to look at the facts that Jesus was actually a, a faithful, observant and loyal Jew for all of his life. He said, who among you can accuse me of sin? And so he wasn't just a, me a nominal member of his, of his religion. He was observant and he was, he was loyal in, in everything that, that he did. He was born, he lived, and he died a Jew. So in Jesus' own life and teachings, we can't see a separation between, necessarily between his message and his concept of religion. It's only our modern idea of what religion is that has gone so far away at times. You know, the popular idea from the essential message of Jesus Christ. Because consider the real Jesus of history and then consider the, the behaviours and attitudes that we so often associate with uh, many of the religious establishments of today. And they were truer back in Jesus' day as well. Jesus was a... He was a poor and homeless man. He slept under bridges. You know, when he had to pay his, his taxes, uh, he had to do a miracle so that uh, his disciples would, could find a coin in a fish's mouth. He didn't even have money to pay his taxes. He wasn't a financial institution. He didn't, he didn't judge his success of his, uh, uh, of his enterprise here on earth based on, on the money that, that he had. And then also, we have to bear in mind his teachings. They were broad and they were embracing. When you look at Jesus' teachings to the common people, not when he was debating with the intelligentsia of the day, but just the main thrust of his teachings, they were broad, they were embracing. He didn't nitpick. He didn't uh, go into the fine minutiae of the doctrinal differences that existed in his day. And boy, did they exist. You know, if you think that... Uh, even within Christianity, there's a lot of differences on this teaching or this other teaching. Well, they were even greater within the different denominations, if you could call them that. They were just sects, really, within Judaism. And hardly ever once do you find Jesus ever engaging with those, except when, when uh, the people from those uh, sects, if you like, engage with him directly. And then look at, look at his, his teaching about, about the community that he came to build. He, he says, all you are brothers and sisters. He rejected the idea of hierarchy completely. 
of, of the exercise of power of the greater over the, the, the lesser so-called, of, of the more powerful over the weaker. Think about how, that, how different that is to how Christ, the Christian church has all too often sadly played itself out in, Christ, in history. And then, of course, look at uh, his teaching, love your enemies. Uh, a teaching that sadly Christianity hasn't always practiced in terms of whom it has considered to be its enemies. And sometimes even less uh, within Christianity itself. You know, in a sense, Jesus had a love-hate relationship with the religion of his day. He loved the worship of God. He loved the, the humble and, and pure and simple-hearted person who came to God. He loved the community that he grew up with. But what he hated about religion of his day was the narrow-mindedness, the nitpickedness, the, the, this intent on dividing rather than uniting. And he, he hated the love of self the love of power, the love of money, the focus on the externals. He hated all those things that cause people in the world today to reject religion. So if you think that there are some things wrong with religion at, at times, you're not alone. Jesus is on your side. And sometimes I wonder if Jesus had come into many of our churches, whether he would be accepted or rejected. After all, here's the the plain and simple truth, Jesus Christ was murdered for religious reasons. So how did Jesus see the religious landscape of his day? Well, as I've said, it was divided into many different sects and you could call them denominations by, by you know, the way that we call Christianity today. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes and all sorts of other, other types of people. And you know, Jesus never ever once told people to come out of one and join another. He never ever did it. In fact, he, never, he hardly ever recognized those divisions because when he looked at the people, he only ever really fundamentally, ultimately saw two different religions. There were those people who followed him and those people who followed other people. Those people who took up his cross and those people who didn't. Those people who came into the king, who accepted and came into the kingdom of God, and those people who didn't. And you know, today there's still fundamentally only two religions. And these two religions are found in every single other religion and denomination in the world. It's exactly the same as in Jesus' day. You know, there's a story about the uh, great evangelist Harry Ironside who was uh, running a big uh, preaching campaign and uh, he'd be heckled by the crowds and uh, what they were saying to him is, well, we're very confused. Well, you know, there's so many Christian denominations and religions in the world today. You know, we don't know which one is right. And Harry answered them and, and he said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. There's only two religions. Now, I know that within those two religions, there's some differences of opinion, minor differences really, but there's only two. Those who are saved by doing and those who are saved by what has been done. And it's still the same in the world today. In every religion, in every denomination, in every sect, you'll find people who are saved by doing the natural human tendency to try to be saved by what we can understand, by what we can do, by, by, by what is tangible and what our senses can understand. And then there are people who are saved by what has been done by Jesus Christ at Calvary and who draw their strength from what he is doing for them every single day. So I find people and I come across them who say, well, I don't want to belong to any religion because they're all false. They're all hypocritical. 
what would Jesus say in, in this case? Well, I want to go here to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in verse 27, it says here, You are the body of Christ and parts of each other. Jesus gave his life so that we could all become part of his body, part of the kingdom of God, so that we could all be interconnected. Christianity is the ultimate religion of no man is an island. Because when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, he connects us with himself, and in himself he connects us with believers all around the world, the church universal, those who believe that they are saved by grace, by confessing the name of Jesus Christ, who believe that they are saved by faith alone. And we become the body of Christ, and, a, and we become a part of each other. To say that we don't need each other is nonsense. That's part of the kingdom of this world. It's not part of the kingdom of God. You see, when I come here to 2 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it tells me here what the criteria is of this body. And I read here, Now faith, hope and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. The greatest thing that the Christian church has, the greatest thing that true religion is, isn't absolute agreement on every doctrine. No. It isn't the greatest number of people. It isn't the most expensive, flashiest buildings. Not at all. It isn't that we all look the same. It isn't that we all talk the same. It is the greatest of all things, which is love. And that's why Jesus himself said in John <clears throat> chapter 13 and 35, This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love each other. So what do we do about the Christian church what do we do? Well, what do you do with your church when it falls short of that ideal of love? What do you do with the people in your congregation, in your Christian community, when you don't see them living up to, to this? What do you do when you're outside a Christian congregation, you look in and you don't necessarily see the community that reflects the ideals of Jesus Christ? And you see, and you see this division between religion and Jesus. Do you reject these people or do you love them as Jesus Christ has loved them? So our advice is find a church where the gospel is preached. Find a church that is true to the teachings of Scripture as you prayerfully and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit understand them. And then, and then join in, love them, serve them, participate and be loyal and joyful because you have understood the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Don't expect perfection just as Christ hasn't expected it of you when he called you to be his son. So don't expect it of others but simply understand that we're the body of, of Christ just healing together and basking in the love of the grace of God. You're watching The Unlimited Show. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. You're watching Dr. Eliezer Gonzalez. We live in the selfie generation, where people judge themselves by how good they look on their latest uh, photo on Facebook or Instagram. We're very focused on outward appearance. And so instead of asking the question, what do I look like? I want to just look at the question, what did Jesus look like? The real Jesus of history. After all, we know what the Hollywood Jesus is like. In the 1960s, we had 
uh, Jeffrey Hunter playing Jesus in King of Kings, and he was the blue-eyed Jesus. And of course, then we had the, uh, the rock Jesus from Jesus Christ uh, Superstar, the, the hippie Jesus, if you like. And then, of course, in uh, the miniseries Jesus of Nazareth, we had the Jesus who barely blinked once during all four hours of the miniseries. Apparently, they did that so that Jesus could stand out from everyone else and, and just have this special aura uh, that you couldn't just put your finger on, but that made him really uh, seem supernatural. So what does the Bible tell us about what Jesus actually looked like? Well, very, very little, actually. In fact, the Gospels themselves have hardly anything to say, in fact, virtually nothing to say about his actual physical appearance. The prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, had prophesied that Jesus would have nothing especially beautiful or especially attractive in his external appearance. And when Judas went to betray Jesus in that famous scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he brings the mob along, and, and he is the one, Judas is the one who has to point out who Jesus is, that it's quite clear that Jesus doesn't stand out from the other disciples because he's taller or more beautiful or he has a halo around his head. In fact, Judas has to point out who Jesus is to the mob. He goes up to Jesus and, and kisses him. That was the sign that Jesus was uh, the one that they were after. So Jesus would have looked just like any other Palestinian Jew of his day. The really interesting thing is that the early Christians gave virtually no importance whatsoever to what Jesus looked like. Today in our society, and, and I guess from the Middle Ages onwards, we've given a lot of importance to what Jesus might have looked like. And we have images in our head of, uh, of what his face was like, what his hair was like, etc. But it was many hundreds of years after Jesus' death and resurrection that the early Christians actually started to actually represent Jesus in, in drawings and, and carvings. So they're not really liable in terms of what the real Jesus of history actually looked like. Historians, archaeologists and anthropologists uh, can give us some idea of what Jesus looked like. And the reason is because they've actually discovered uh, many skeletons of first century Palestinian males. In other words, contemporaries of Jesus Christ. And in terms of height and, and general, general features that they can discern from those skeletons, they're pretty much of a muchness. They're pretty much the same. And so historians and uh, anthropologists speculate that Jesus was probably around five foot one high. People weren't as tall back then as they were these days because of uh, nutritional issues. Of course, their life expectancy was much shorter. They also uh, speculate that Jesus would have had a darkish olive complexion and that he would have had a, a bushy, or curly beard, as was typical for Jewish men of that time. And he also would have, would have had short, uh, curly hair. And that's very different to the image of Jesus Christ that we see pictured today. A majestic, tall, uh, Western man with long, wavy hair. In fact, we know that long, wavy hair wasn't the done thing. Uh, for people in that time because the Apostle Paul, who was uh, roughly contemporary with Jesus, just uh, you know, um, a few decades after, he specifically says that it is shameful for a man to have long hair. Now, that was in his culture in his day. So we know that Jesus didn't have long hair like he's pictured in the movies. So what's the relevance of this? What's the importance of all this? Well, first of all, I believe that the Bible doesn't focus at all on the outward physical appearance of Jesus because it's just the principle that comes throughout the whole message of the Bible that God is not interested in what you look like on the outside. He's not interested in your wardrobe. He's not interested on, on what race you belong to. He's not interested in any of that. But God looks at the heart. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God appreciates you and loves you from the inside out. And the second key lesson that, that, that I understand from the fact that the Bible writers never focus on Jesus' physical appearance is that much more important than what Jesus looked like was what Jesus did. 
Because although the Christian church didn't focus at all on what Jesus looked like, boy, did they focus on what he did. On the fact that he died for our sins to save us from the guilt and the penalty of, of our sins, as had been prophesied hundreds of years by the prophet Isaiah and other prophets in, in, the, in the Old Testament scriptures. And the fact that on the third day he rose from the dead in power and majesty and glory to bring salvation to the world. That is what the early Christian church focused on. And you know, for me and, and for you, I believe that that is what Jesus wants us to focus on today. Not on what he looks like, not on, not on the externals, but, what on he, but on what he has done for you at Calvary, where he gave his life for you. And by rising from the dead, that tells me and tells you as well, that no matter what situation we may be facing, there's power to be found in Jesus Christ. And that he is there for you, wherever you are, however attractive or unattractive you may be on the outside. Thank you for watching The Unlimited Show. To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there for a free devotional delivered directly to you each day. Until next time, go out there and live unlimited in Christ. This program has been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.